Have you ever wondered why Western powers support Israel? Well, if you want to know more about that, about that, then come with me as we check out this video. Hello and welcome to my channel. This video highlights why the UK, US and France are so adamantly pro-Israel right now. Now, in this video, this lady talks about the Ben Garon Canal, which is the proposal to connect the Red Sea to the Mediterranean Sea. Now, there is already uh, a connection of the Suez Canal, but why have another one? More reason why Israel want to seize Gaza, annex the land and take it over so that they can build another canal through it. And the US and the UK and France are up for that because it's going to make them a lot of money at the cost of millions of lives unalived. Now, she talks about a lot of things in this video. More reason you need to watch this video till the very end so let's check out this video together i think i just figured out why the us uk and france are so adamantly pro-israel right now like we all knew it had to do with money but i'm gonna tell you exactly how there's a shout out to my uncle who told me to do some research on the ben gurion canal and i did and i took notes now who is ben gurion he is known as the founding father of israel he was the first prime minister yes you guessed it in 1948 and this canal is a proposal to connect the Red Sea to the Mediterranean Sea through here, right? But we already have a connection, and it's called the Suez Canal. And if you don't know the history, let's get into it. The Suez Canal was opened in 1869, and the Suez Canal Company was given a 99-year lease to own the Suez Canal. And guess who owned the Suez Canal Company? The French and the British. I think it's also important to note that the British Empire originally was opposed to building the canal because they thought it would directly threaten their economy, but instead they just decided let's benefit from it, bought 44% of the shares in 1875, so they were all good. Now in 1888, the maritime powers, Great Britain, Germany, Austria, Hungary, Spain, France, Italy, the Netherlands, Russia, and Turkey signed this thing called the Convention of Constantinople. What's important about this is it said that every single nation should be able to use the canal, whether at war, at peace, it cannot be denied access to anyone. In 1949, Egypt denied Israel access after the Nakba, after they did what they did. That was a huge deal, it was a big statement because of this. Now in 1956, when the US was basically having a proxy war with the Soviet Union in that region, the Egyptian president at the time, Gamal Abdel Nasser, decided to nationalize the Suez Canal, so take it away from the British and French-owned company, essentially because the US um, reneged on a previous agreement to finance the Aswan Dam project that was for the Nile, getting water and electricity to the Egyptian population, etc., etc. This was a massive shift, a huge move in the region and globally. Probably why it was also used as a battleground in the 1967 Arab-Israeli War. Now, after the Arab-Israeli War and the Geneva Conference, etc., etc., what you need to know is Israel and Egypt signed a peace treaty at Camp David, signed by Jimmy Carter. This is from a U.S. government website, by the way. My sources are checked, tried, and trusted. And the U.S. was given credit for orchestrating a peace treaty between these two countries. Again, why were they involved from the beginning? Who knows? The U.S. has always been here. We're in 1979 now. Should all be cool. A peace treaty was signed. Like, everything is perfect. Suez Canal is open to everyone. Cool, cool, great, right? Wrong. 16 years before this, and even before the Arab-Israeli War, the U.S. Department of Energy and the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory had been making a plan for something else. In 1963, they made a classified plan to help excavate the Negev Desert Hills with 520 nuclear bombs to help create a canal. This was only made public in 1993, 1994, depending on the sources you check. So at the time of the peace treaty, nobody knew this was going on, except of course, Jimmy Carter. Now we could also talk about how the war was a product of collusion between Britain, France and Israel, and they decided to initiate the war, but we'll save that for another time. You might be asking yourself, why do they wanna build another canal? Like we have the Suez Canal right here. Why do we need a canal through here? <sighs> this is where the money comes in, baby. Without the Suez Canal right here, ships from Asia would have to go all the way down and around Africa in order to reach Europe. This canal right here currently sees the passage of 12 to 15%, depending on the source you check, of the world's trade and 10% of the global oil distribution. 
just this little canal right here. Now who benefits from this? Egypt, of course, it's their canal, right? In 2023, they broke records and made a revenue of 9.4 billion US dollars. Yay for Egypt, right? Well, how do you think the US, the UK, France, and Israel feel about that? Not good. Suez Canal is not ideal. Up until 2014, you could only go one way, which meant for six hours it went in one direction and six hours it went in the other, which was super not efficient. It was also not wide enough to accommodate some of the largest ships in the world. So what happened in 2021? You might remember this. One of the world's biggest ships jammed the Suez Canal, leading to approximately 900 million dollars of losses. And the US was really not happy about this and the Pentagon released a statement that this made it difficult for the movement of their military vessels, um, specifically to Israel, but not to worry, they had other ways. Now, when they're planning the Ben Gurion Canal, they're planning to have it 50 meters deep, which is 10 meters deeper than the Suez Canal, and 200 meters wide, which will facilitate the biggest ships in the world going in both directions. Only that, but directly competing with the Suez Canal, Israel projects that it would make them an annual revenue of about $6 billion a year plus. And now for the interesting part, there's one feature about the Suez Canal that's also really inconvenient, and that's the fact that it's built on pretty sandy shores. Now, I'm not an engineer. Now, from what I read, Sandy shores are pretty inconvenient for a canal. They constantly need maintenance. But where Israel wants to dish it out to the Mediterranean Sea, it's a rocky land texture, which is ideal for these conditions. Let's zoom into this. That's the Gaza Strip. How annoying is the placement of the Gaza Strip for them? They have to actually turn the canal around so that it avoids this piece of land. Do you see where I'm getting at? They don't want ships to have to do this entire round and add a little time and inconvenience to their journey and have such close proximity to Gaza. What if they just built it through Gaza? Oh no, wait, they don't want to do that. They don't want to help the Palestinian economy. What do you mean? That would defeat the entire purpose, wouldn't it? Unless they took that land. Yeah, that's what's going on. Israel wants to seize Gaza, annex the land, take it over so they can build their canal through it. And the US, the UK and France are all for that because it's going to make them a lot of money at the cost of millions of lives. Right. <laughs> Unfreaking believable. Building this canal will not only redirect trade, but historically, Arab states use the Suez Canal to put pressure on Israel. So it will not only increase Israel's geopolitical standing, but it'll also become a strategic asset for diplomatic negotiations for Israel and take away the most powerful thing the Arab states had against the US, UK, France, and Israel to keep them in line. And there you have it. That's the reason. At the end of the Sinai War 1956, Israel and Egypt faced a new diplomatic security situation during which the uh, perceptions, interests, and power dip dispositions prevailing before the war underwent change. Attendant on these events, the two countries embarked upon a sequence of limited arrangements agreed upon both formally and informally, arranged by third parties, the chief of which were the United Nations Secretary General at the time and U.S. Uh, government officials. One of these arrangements was designated to resolve Israel's demand for freedom of passage through the Suez Canal. Documents in Israel's archives together with documents from the U.S. State Department and U.N. archives have recently exposed a fascinating chapter in Egypt. Now, why is the U.S. so unwavering in its support for Israel? From the beginning, former U.S. President Harry Truman was the first world leader to recognize Israel when it was created in 1948. Now, in part because of personal ties, Truman's former business partner, Edward Jacobson, played a pivotal role in laying the uh, groundwork for the U.S. in recognizing Israel as a state. But there was also strategic considerations driving the decision. Now, this was right after the World War II 
when the Cold War between the US and the Soviet Union was taking shape. The Middle East, with its oil reserves and strategic waterways, which is the Suez Canal, was a key battleground for superpower hegemonic influence. Now, the US was taking over from severely weakened European powers as the primary Western power broker in the Middle East. But even then, support for Israel was not unequivocal. Now, that is partially or partly rooted in the aftermatch 1967 war in which Israel defeated the poorly laid armies of Egypt, Syria and Jordan and occupied the rest of histor historical Palestine as well as some territory from Syria and Egypt. Now, since then, the U.S. has acted unequivocally to support Israel's military superiority in the region and to prevent hostile acts against it by Arab nations. There was also the 1973 war that ended with Israel uh, defeating Egyptian and Syrian forces, partly to drive uh, a wage between Egypt and Syria and thwart Soviet influence, the U.S. used the aftermath of the 1973 war to lay the groundwork for a peace deal between Israel and Egypt that was eventually cemented in 1979. Now, you bet Israel is the uh, largest cumulative recipient of U.S. foreign aid in the post-World War II era. Now, in 2016, then-President Barack Obama signed a defense agreement with Israel providing $38 billion in U.S. military support over 10 years, including funding for the Iron Dome missile defense system. Bear in mind that Israel is not exactly in need of aid. Now, it is a high-income country with a thriving high-tech sector. Like all things foreign uh, policy-related, public opinion, money and the influence money buys in politics have also played a role in U.S. policy towards Israel and the Palestinians. Now, American public opinion has long tilted in favor of Israel and against the Palestinians in part because Israel had a superior PR machine. But headline-grabbing violent actions by pro-Palestinian groups such as the 1972 uh, car in which 11 Israeli Olympic athletes were unalived also generated sympathy for Israel. More Americans are warming to the Palestinian uh, because according to an annual survey conducted by uh, Gallup, the February poll found that 25% of Americans sympathize more with Palestinians, a two percentage point increase over the previous year and a full six percentage points higher than uh, 2018. Now, favorable ratings for the Palestinian Authority also hit uh, a new high of 30%, a seven percent point improvement over 2020. But Israel still holds far more sway in the court of U.S public opinion. That same poll found that 58% of Americans sympathize more with Israel, while 75% of Americans read Israel favorably. Now, there are a number of organizations in the U.S. that advocate for U.S. support of the Israel. The largest and most uh, politically powerful is the American Israel Public Affairs Committee. Members of the organization would influence through grassroots organizing, advocacy, and fundraising among American Jews in the U.S. as well as Christian evangelical churches. But what do you, my viewers, have to say about this video? Don't forget to share your thoughts in the comments. From me to bye-bye and see you in my next video. Let's get chatting.